I still remember watching the entire keynote when Microsoft announced the Surface Book. It was electrifying when Panos Panay just detached it in the middle of the presentation and said, it's a tablet too. It was a very, very cool concept, and I loved that the Surface Book was designed with that in mind. But then in practice, when I actually started using it, I had several Surface Books actually fail for all the same reason. The fact is, is the detachment could not happen without power being delivered to the Surface. If for some reason the power that was routed through the base panel was not making it to the Surface, then there had to be some weird end around ways to detach the two devices. All in all, it was a relatively finicky machine. And personally, I didn't really use the detachment mechanism for anything more than a party trick. While it was really cool that you had still a full desktop experience in a 15 inch clipboard style tablet, it really wasn't all that practical for me because it didn't have the same features that the original Surface Pro had in a dedicated kickstand. And so for me, while I wanted to love the Surface Book, it didn't end up being one of my more liked Surfaces. But out with the old and in with the new in the form of the Surface Laptop Studio. Instead of the detachment mechanism that we get on the Surface Pro or the Surface Book, instead this has a hinge that allows you to reposition this display in several different configurations. Cool? Absolutely. Practical? Maybe. But the big question for me is whether this is the big replacement for the Surface Book and will follow as the best portable Surface that you can get. Let's talk about it. This is NOISO and this is the Surface Laptop Studio review. In terms of overall design as a laptop, the Surface Laptop Studio is very, very unique. Not only does it have the Microsoft Surface unique sort of paint on the aluminum frame, but also it's got a odd sort of platform that sits above the base of the laptop. It definitely is visually interesting and unlike anything else on the market, but I just wanna talk for a few seconds about its actual repairability. I released a video covering the upgrade process of the Surface Laptop Studio, which you can watch here. It's great that Microsoft allows you to upgrade the SSD on the Surface Laptop Studio, but it's less great that they choose to follow this design language that was initially popularized by Apple. Actually, they kind of go past Apple in that there's no exposed screws here. Yes, this is an upgradable and repairable device, but unfortunately, you're going to have to actually tear off the bottom feet and technically get them replaced if you want to do that upgrade, which I'm not too happy about. Exposed screws aren't really all that ugly. Frankly, with a more industrial design, it could actually look pretty nice, but Microsoft instead decides to hide them and charge you an extra however much money in order to get a replacement set of feet. That extends to the fascia piece that sits around the sides of the device that allow you to access a couple more screws. It's plastic and it's cheap feeling. And Microsoft could have hypothetically made it metal if they actually put the screws on top of it. And I just don't get it. It's very, very tacky in my mind. Outside of this, this follows the regular Surface design language, which is to say I actually enjoy it. I like the fact that the aluminum doesn't get nearly as cold as, you know, MacBook aluminum, for example, and the kind of faint sort of pattern and texture allows for less display of any sort of scratches, dents, or fingerprints. An additional benefit over the original Surface Book is that since there's no odd fulcrum hinge and since the whole laptop doesn't need to be built into the top of the device, the balance between the bottom and the top panel is a lot better. So this has substantially better balance than the original Surface Book and pretty on par with a lot of other laptops. It didn't tend to tilt as much backwards and fall back in my lap nearly as much as the Surface Book and Surface Book 2 did. It's a beautiful machine, but it's also relatively bulky. Compared to the Surface Laptop 4, it is substantially larger, thicker, and heavier, and it feels a lot less like a thin and light device and instead more like a traditional laptop that would be a little bit tougher to lug around in a backpack. And that unique design, honestly, while really cool, is frankly 
a little nerve-wracking for me. You see, all of the cables for the display are stored right about here, and they go along this very, very thin mesh into the bottom of the device. Now, I am not an engineer, but I do have some worries that over time we might start seeing failures of the display cables in Surface Laptop Studios from those cables becoming detached or marred or damaged or anything like that. The design concerns are added to the fact that when you actually lean the laptop forward like this, there's actually a slight bend in the display. It doesn't seem like the display has en enough support, so I will show in B-roll footage that it actually kind of hangs down, which again, just seems a little bit less premium. The display is just as incredible as you would expect with any Surface device. It's got a 2400 by 1600 14 inch display, which is incredibly bright, maybe not as bright as it needs to be to get over the fact of how glossy it is. I will always have the problem with Surface devices that they are incredibly reflective. And so if you are on a dark screen, like in dark mode for Visual Studio Code, for example, you will be looking at yourself in a black mirror, and I hate that experience. I hope that the next step in laptop displays, including touch displays, is in anti-glare coverings, so that every single laptop display doesn't have the same sort of reflection problem. The bezels, while significantly smaller than probably the Surface Book, are still quite large compared to a lot of other modern devices. If you were picking this up and using it as a tablet, I would understand, but I don't think a lot of people are going to actually be lifting up the entire device to use it as a tablet. Instead, they probably have it set up somewhere and they're using it to draw. Oh, speaking of which, since the pin charges down here underneath the lip, it is really the only sort of mechanism I can see that actually gives any sort of reason for this platform style design. While it is very cool and unique, it's not very practical because it means that there's significantly less internal space for the laptop itself. And maybe they could have had better internal cooling or maybe a larger battery. One other thing that's missing from the device is ports. Like many other modern devices, this doesn't have any sort of dedicated USB-A port or HDMI port. Instead, there is a two USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports on this side and the Surface Connect port on this side. I am tired of the Surface Connect port. Yes, at the time of its release, it was relatively innovative. It was comparable to MagSafe in that you could charge and actually transfer data even across a magnetic cable, which is really cool. But frankly, I'm not even sure where my Surface dock went. It's somewhere around the house, but it's quite a few years old now and doesn't have all the ports that I need, and it doesn't have the same sort of speeds that modern Thunderbolt 4 ports have. And so I really don't understand why Microsoft has held onto it so abruptly. It gives reasons for Surface lovers to upgrade, but it doesn't give a lot of reasons for other people to want to upgrade to it. I guess now Apple brought back the MagSafe, so maybe it's supposed to be competitive with MagSafe, but considering this device has no HDMI port like the MacBook Pro 14 inch, and it doesn't have a USB-A port like of a lot of other devices, it's kind of just not great. Now, obviously it's tough to fit a USB-A port in something this small. You would probably need substantially more space, but they have substantially more space if they got rid of the stupid platform design. I'm sorry, the unique platform design. Let's talk a little bit about the performance of the Surface Laptop Studio. This is the base model, which means it has an Intel Core i5 11th generation H series processor, meaning that it does have a little bit more horsepower and TDP than the base U series, but it has 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of base storage. This model in particular doesn't have any sort of dedicated graphics, which is fine for me in most cases, but if you do want a little bit of extra graphics and video horsepower, then you'll have to go for one of those models. Now, I'm not too disappointed with the internal specs. I think the performance for its design is relatively good. And one thing that I was very, very impressed by was the fan noise or lack thereof. See, on either side of the device, there's tiny little vents on the front, and on this side for the fans to export heat, to send out heat. And frankly, 
I never really noticed it. Yes, occasionally I would put my hands on the side of the laptop and I'd feel a light breeze coming out, almost, you know, drying the sweat from my hands, but it didn't really get loud enough to the point where it was really bothering me. Even at full blast, it never really ramped to a point where it was super audible. That's great. I love the idea that I could have a relatively quiet, capable machine. That is, if this device was actually truly capable. Now, in most cases, the 11th generation i5 H series processor that this has should be plenty powerful, considering that I lived on an i5 on the Surface Pro 8 for quite some time. But ironically enough, I had substantially more issues with this than a lot of the other devices that I've tried recently. I'm not quite sure why, but there were more problems with crashes and glitches and video signal not sending, all kinds of things. And the performance actually kind of fell behind a number of the thin and lights that I've used over the last years. Now granted, some of those thin and lights have been i7 11th generations, but their processors have run at a lower TDP than this one. Again, I think Microsoft could have built the bottom panel to be, you know, one thickness and had more internal space for a dedicated heat sink that was a little bit larger. I think that would allow for a little bit more cooling than we got. Then, as I mentioned, the battery. Now, I typically got around five to six hours of battery of mixed use battery life out of this machine, which was fine, if not stellar. Now, it's not nearly as impressive as the M1 MacBooks that I've tried, but it was decent for a laptop like this, which should have a lot of horsepower. Finally, let's talk about what makes a lot of surfaces great in the keyboard and the trackpad. This keyboard is relatively similar to a lot of other Surface devices in that it's got a decent amount of travel, a decent amount of good feedback for each of the keystrokes, and while the keys aren't aluminum topped like the Surface Book, they still feel quite nice on the fingers. I enjoy using this keyboard with one exception. The front of the device, because of the ridge and because of the kind of sharp edge, it's not the most comfortable to rest your palms on relative to some other machines. It was a small problem and it usually only happened when I was sitting on the couch or back from the machine a little bit, but I did notice it. When it comes to the trackpad, this is the first Windows trackpad that I've used that has had an actually good feedback system that is not actually mechanical. Instead, it's got little vibration motors that make you feel like you're clicking down on something, but you're not, similar to the touchpads on MacBooks. Speaking of a massive amount of money, this starts at an MSRP of $2,000, which is really, really steep for even a premium laptop like this. Now, granted, you're probably not going to be paying that at this time. You're probably going to be paying somewhere closer in the 1200 to 1500 range if you look for the right deals, which is a lot more compelling price point. But there are a lot of great laptops in the market at that price range. Personally, I've seen refurbished models for this drop under $1,000, which is a very, very interesting price for what is a premium high-end laptop. Now, while I started this review in a relatively down mood because of the performance not being what I want it to be, the design being a little bit compromising, and the bugs just killing the experience, ironically enough, I actually am ending this review with a positive note. The fact is, is if I were to choose one device to do everything for me, the Surface Laptop Studio might just be it. And the reason for that is there's not a lot of comparable devices on the market that specifically achieve the exact same experience. For example, the Surface Laptop 4, which is one of my favorite clamshell laptops, unfortunately doesn't have any sort of mechanism for editing photos in Photoshop with the pen. And so that experience is missing. Then the Surface Pro 8 that I have here in the background would have that solution for Photoshop, but in terms of typing on the device while it's sitting on my lap on the couch, that experience is going to be significantly worse because of the lack of balance relative to a traditional clamshell laptop like this. And then of course, it's not going to have the same sort of performance headroom as the Surface Laptop Studio. Finally, the last comparison I'll make is to traditional two-in-one convertibles like the HP Spectre X360. 
which is a great machine and it's very, very capable in terms of performance. But one of the biggest problems that I have with a lot of those two-in-one devices is in the fan noise, which gets very, very loud and obnoxious, especially relative to something like this, the Surface Laptop Studio, which was almost silent all the time. The primary reason why I was so down on this entire experience is because it seems like Microsoft was just so close to an incredible machine that does everything for me and seemed to just kind of fumble the ball only a few yards from the end zone. It seems that they really wanted to get this very, very unique platform design together. And I don't really see all that practical reason for it other than the fact that it charges the pen. I'm not an engineer, but it seems like they could have worked with a lot more internal space or a similarly great design had they just curved the edges a little bit. Maybe software updates and the Surface Laptop Studio 2 will solve some of the issues that we had with this device. If we use the Surface Book as an example, then chances are they're probably not going to change the design much between the next gener or into the next generation and probably not the generation after that. Maybe we'll have to wait for the eighth generation to finally see a modern design change. But until then, I'm going to say that the Surface Laptop Studio is the most innovative Surface Laptop that we've seen in years, and probably one of the most innovative laptops that we've seen in a long time. At least of the ones that are true viable options for consumers. Between this and the Surface Duo 2, I think Microsoft might actually have their mojo back when it comes to designing truly innovative hardware. And they're not even a hardware company. Where are you, Apple? The last comparison I'll make for this device is to the MacBook Pro 14 inch, which starts at the exact same price point. That is a completely different machine, but frankly beats this on a lot of metrics. If you're looking for pure performance, then that laptop is going to probably torch this one in most sort of benchmarks. I don't think I'd really consider it compared to this because this offers a truly different hardware experience. But if I were specifically looking for a laptop to edit videos, then I would go for that one in a heartbeat over this one. The biggest thing that keeps me away from the MacBook Pro 14 inch is the software, which is really ironic because it seems like Historically, it's always been the other way around. Apple holds on to users because they have this lock-in software design, and I'm on the other side of the fence saying, I never want to use a MacBook again as my primary laptop. Instead, I'm stuck to Windows 10 and Windows 11. Thank you for watching InnoISO. I hope you like this review of the Microsoft Surface Laptop Studio, which I actually really enjoyed reviewing. If you did enjoy this review, be sure to get subscribed and check out my playlist covering other Surface devices, which I'll have linked somewhere over here. It's been a great experience using this device, and I'd love to see all of your comments down below, and be sure to like the video if you did like it. Thanks for watching, I'll catch you in the next one.